I don't necessarily have a ton of faith that higher education, um, elite higher education, can be reformed um, in ways that are meaningful. I think there are a lot of baked in problems that um, are just it's not easy to see how to dissolve them. Um, and so, I mean, these institutions rightfully want diversity. There's limits on how they can achieve that. Now, thanks to the Supreme Court decision, they can't, no one can check a box. So the only way to signal diversity is through the college essay, which means this kind of performative discussion about race and trauma, et cetera, is now really the only avenue through which for, you know, for colleges to figure out who's diverse and for applicants to signal their diversity. Um, and I don't, I don't think there's much that can be done about it. Um, and so, you know, in a, in a perfect world, I, uh, you know, if I was in charge of Yale and Harvard and everything else, I would probably have SAT cutoffs, say 1300, and everything would be a randomized lottery above that. Um, but, you know, I am not uh, the emperor of higher ed. So, uh, you know, I, yeah, I'm not, uh, you know, other than some utopian solutions like that, I, I don't know that there's much to be done, but I'm, I'm fascinated by it, you know, um, in the sort of pulse, compulsory racial performance that, um, not just, you know, black and brown students, but also white students have to go through. I mean, I worked as a college tutor for many years. And one of the things that was striking to me is that I would work with wealthy white kids who are like, look, I'm not just rich and white. My dad's an alcoholic, right? So I haven't had an easy life or, um, you know, I, I'm neurodivergent or this or that, you know? And so, whereas um, I think racial performance and, and passing and, and code switching and all of these sort of ways passing. of positioning identity used to be just folks of color, it's now kind of expanded to everyone. And that's one of the things I'm interested in. This kind of racial performance is compulsory across the board, whether you're white, black, brown, yellow, or whatever. Well, all right, let me, let me do devil's advocate here because um, I feel that's the same the way. way about these things as you, I don't see how it can change. There are times when you can't get the toothpaste back in the tube and the basic commitments of perfectly sane and benevolent people who are now running elite institutions and also just institutions mm -hmm. of learning. I don't see how it can change. There's a whole generation that's set in, their hair is already graying and they're going to hire people like them. But yeah, let's say, um, I have to make up one of my characters. Um, her name is Monique. She's she's 17 and she's Monique is a black girl. I'm picking that's not kind of an antique black girl name now, but I don't want it to be too real. But Monique is writing her essay and she's not allowed to say she's black, but she's signaling that she's black. It's clear that anybody reads this knows that she grew up maybe lower or middle middle class and she's black. She signals it because there is a certain kind of experience that black people have that is uniquely unjust because of our history in this country and possibly the feelings against black people are more deeper or more virulent than against others. I frankly don't think so, but Monique has been taught that and her parents mm -hmm. probably think so and I could be wrong. So she signals it in her essay and that does help her get into, I'm going to pick a place at random, Vanderbilt, Rice, whatever. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that? You're calling it a performance and there are certain yeah. people who would bristle, but Monique may be thinking she's being a good human being in 2024, right? Yeah. So I, the first thing I would say about performance, uh, I come from the uh, land of, of critical theory. And so I'm thinking about performance in, in the sense of, you know, that someone like Judith Butler. Who, Judith uh, Butler. Okay. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. um, that we do all have to, in various ways, um, signal our identity to folks in power in ways that makes us legible. Um, my overall take and my very strong opinion is that we shouldn't moralize about this, right? Like, I mean, we all in various ways, particularly if you're folks of color, have to navigate the reality that people in hiring and admissions want diversity. They expect it to um, come in a certain kind of package, right? Um, and that's the incentive structure. And I, I think um, if you want to, I think there's a certain kind of, you know, um, more conservative person who, who might say, well, these people are just taking advantage of their identity to get a leg up and blah, blah, blah. And that's actually not my take at all. My take is the incentive structures are bad that compel most of us to play these kinds of games. And if you want to complain about it, I don't think you should blame the individual people who are just doing their best to find opportunities where they come, like most of us. I think we should think about, like, why are these systems in place that require black kids to feel like they have to talk about trauma in their college essay, right? Like, I think that's not on them. Um, that's, that's on, you know, administrators and admissions folks and, and other, other forces in universities that, that, you know, yeah. put, make the incentive structure look the way it does. I think, um, just like you find a, a megalosaurus bone in England and it's this enormous thing and there are no lizards walking around that big and you're trying to figure out how things go. And we think, 
Couldn't they figure out that things had gone extinct? But no, you really have to pull the camera back. In yeah. the same way, I think a great many people today, and not just Monique, I think just people of color and particularly this color, mm -hmm. I think that we tend to forget how weird it is in human history for the bedrock of your racial identity and the thing that probably even almost gets your endorphins going is a sense of yourself as oppressed. The mm -hmm. idea that that is the main thing about you and the thing that you're almost proud of, that mm -hmm. you get through life despite the oppression. It's understandable where that comes from um, among black people. And, oh, I know what everybody's thinking. What about Jewish people? But that's the thing. It's different. Yes, mm -hmm. there's an idea of we will never forget. There's an idea that we're constantly persecuted. But it's not the center of Jewish identity to feel that there are people who think we're inferior and we mm -hmm. just might be, and we're going to yeah. give into it a little bit. And try no, the idea with Jewish people is we're not inferior. I'm not sure that black people always know that as much, understandable why, but it's a very unusual sense of identity. And this way of writing an essay encourages that. So how do you show that you're black? Something bad happened to you. That's, yeah. I, I find that unhealthy, but I don't know if it can be fixed. I agree. Oh, I find it totally unhealthy. I find it um, psychologically deforming. I think it um, programs students to think a certain way about themselves. And it's not just black students. Um, and, no. You know, when I was at NYU, I had a um, student who warned me at the beginning of the semester that they are a mentally fragile person and that I should be aware of that. Right. And, you know, on the that. one... Yeah, yeah. And on the one hand, you know, like whatever accommodation someone has is, is fine. That's for someone else to decide, not me. Um, but the, the, what stuck with me was the, the way she framed it, right? It wasn't like I have XYZ condition that might make ABC things difficult for me or that I might need more time or whatever. It was like who I am is mentally fragile, you know? Um, and I think um, the, that it's not just race. It's, it's all yeah. sorts of other th stuff where we, many of us um, are now programmed to think um, on a kind of deficit model, you know? And I just, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's especially healthy. It's understandable in a lot of ways. You know, um, I'm a big fan of the um, historian Christopher Lash, and he wrote a book called The Culture of Narcissism, where, you know, he made the point. Connor, this, I literally, I read it last week, just by oh, chance. Oh, nice. Yeah, it, I'm a big Lash fan. And, you know, the point he makes there is like, yes, there is this narcissistic self-absorption and this wounded mentality and victim, et cetera. Um, but it's a result of, economic forces. This isn't just a cultural change. In other words, this isn't people who need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. The world is uncertain. And in, in the 70s, Lash was talking about nuclear anxiety, econo uh, environmental, economic anxiety, inflation, whatever. But today, it's really the same. And so, you know, I think there's a certain narrative that's like these kids are snowflakes and they need to buck up. And there's that's not entirely wrong, right? There is a cultural dimension to everything. But then there's also this but they're other doing piece. it for a reason. Yeah. It, yeah calling yeah. the name doesn't make any sense. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And universities are increasingly a rat race and college emissions. I mean, college acceptance rates have plummeted over the last few years. It's it's remarkable. I mean, some institutions that, um, you know, I think Boston College has dropped from like a, in the last decade of 40 or 50 percent acceptance rate to a 20 percent acceptance rate. Um, the school I teach at's dropped like a stone. So, you know, there are a lot of pressures on these kids. There's there's academic pressures. There's, you know, environmental pressures. They're worried about climate change. There's, you know, war. There's there's a lot of problems. So I have um even as I find, I agree with you that this this orientation is really bad for people, minorities in particular. I also think it's, you know, um, understandable in a certain way. Yeah, it's throughout the culture. And that's actually, Lash, that book was one that I had sort of pretended to have read forever. Yeah, and then I realized, no, I need to actually read it. And yeah, I was good. just thinking, I wish he were writing now because... You know, the book is now in inevitably dated in terms of its references. And I was thinking that I agree with everything he's saying, or like 90% of what he's saying, except I think there's also, there's a mission creep. And you're mm -hmm. right that now this is all over the culture. It's by no means just black students mm -hmm. and black people. But there's a mission creep, I think, from the civil rights movement, where it yeah. starts with activism. You want to go change the world. But there's also a sense of purpose and a certain sense of fellowship that you get when you are engaging in activism. And when... When the, the more concrete things are finished, when you've got a Civil Rights Act of 1964, you've got the, the Fair Housing Act, so mm -hmm. you don't have the apartheid that there used to be. Once that happens, you might still want to keep going. There's a part of humanity that likes 
feeling united against an enemy. That's probably cooked yeah. into us because of, you know, our deep past. And I think that that mission creep starts in the 70s. And I think that then other groups look to black people and model their sense of identity on this idea of being a victim. And it's not that people are snowflakes. It's not that people are manipulative. Yeah. There's no such thing as a poverty pimp. It's that all of us are atoms caught up in all of this. But yeah, yeah no one can be blamed. But it's, we live in a weird time. I mean, we in do. a way, I understand this less than I understand what was going on 50, 50 years ago. 